Welcome back. Uh, if you have just joined the live, let me tell you, we have our board certified expert, Dr. Srini Ganga Sani with us today, and he's answering the questions about heart health, how to take care of your heart. So Dr. Srini, uh, coming to the next question, uh, is hyperthyroidism uh, a risk factor for the heart health? So hyper or hypo, both can affect the heart in a different ways. So hyperthyroidism by producing more thyroid hormone, which increases the metabolism, it causes the heart to go faster. And it can cause an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation, which is the upper chamber. Instead of going in a normal, systematic, regular way, it becomes very irregularly irregular. So that's what the hyperthyroidism causes, the heart point of view. And atrial fibrillation can cause the strokes. So when the heart, instead of going regularly, when it's going erratic and irregular, especially the upper chambers, so that causes the blood clots to form in the upper chamber, which can cause the strokes. So that's how the hyperthyroidism can affect the heart. When it comes to the hypothyroidism, which is a low thyroid, where the thyroid is not produced enough, that can cause the weight gain, and that can cause sometimes the fluid around the heart called pericardial effusion. So sometimes the heart rate goes slow. So sometimes I, every time I put a pacemaker in, I always check the thyroid, make sure that the thyroid is not too low, causing their heart rate to be going too slow. So if the heart rate is going slow because of the thyroid being low, it's easy fix. Give a thyroid supplementation, their heart rate comes up and I don't need to put a pacemaker in. So that's one thing we always check, make sure that the thyroid is not causing the heart rate to go slow because your thyroid is not enough produced by your thyroid gland. Okay. And then uh, the obesity, is that, that can be a factor? Like does being overweight increase the risk of heart disease? Yeah, obesity directly affects the diabetes, effectively directly affects the hypertension and high cholesterol. So I think indirectly, all these are risk factors for the, the blockages to develop in the future. So I think uh, if you don't take care of the problem early on, it can lead to the hypertension, it can lead to the diabetes, it can lead to the hypercholesterolemia or high lipids, which it slowly cause the blockages to happen in the future. By itself, it can cause cardiomyopathy if the obese people, not all the obese people have the blockages. Not all the skinny people don't have the blockages. And in the personal experience, my biggest patient I've ever done angiogram on is a 500 pound patient, no blockages whatsoever, okay? So I also have a 28 year old female, 130 pounds, and with a family history with a high cholesterol, all the arteries are blocked, has to go for a bypass surgery. So obesity is definitely a risk factor, but you need to have a, I think there is genetic predisposition which makes some people, some families more prone to develop the blockages. But all these risk factors we talked about and we're going to talk about are increases the risk, additive risk. So somebody has a hypertension, it causes probably two to three times more increase in the blockages. And then you have diabetes, there's another three to four times increase in risk of developing the, the blockages. So if you're a smoker, it increases another five to six times more. So it's just additive. So the people who have a diabetes or hypertension or smokers are a lot higher risk than just having a hypertension or just have a diabetes. So all these risk factors are additive. So you need to take care of each one of them, you got to tackle each risk factor individually, independently, so that our risk will go down in, a, in the future so that these blockages don't form. Okay, okay. And the next question is really good. Even I have this as a question by myself. And uh, like we are the smart watches that claim uh, to detect the atrial fibrillation, should we rely upon those or the uh, regular checkups is the only good option? No, no I think uh, the, the smartwatches, the technology has changed quite a bit right now. So you don't want to depend on the diagnosis. I use it significant amount of times. Once we do the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation or any kind of arrhythmias, the, as any smartwatches, you know, Apple watch or a Samsung watch, or the thing called CardioMobile or Cardia device, which is very good in identifying the, the arrhythmia or a rhythm difference. So you can look at an EKG as good as what we do in the office by doing any of these smart devices, but only one or two or five leads is not, it's not going to replace the evaluation by a physician. But in collaboration with a the physician, these will definitely help us to treat our patients a lot better. So technology is there, technology is helping us. So if somebody is having symptoms once every month or two months, if you have Apple Watch and you get a palpitation, you don't know what the palpitation is. If I see 100 patients for the palpitations in the office, probably 90 of them, nothing to worry about. But 10 of them, there's something going on. So for those 90 people, 
you don't need to have a million dollar workup. But I think when you have this, you can identify that, hey, I'm getting palpitations, I caught on the Apple Watch, this is it, and go to the doctor, cardiologist, or internal medicine, or family physician, they can look at it and say, hey, this is just a benign arrhythmia, we don't need to worry about it, versus, hey, there is something going on, we need to go to the next level and identify if there is a problem. I think those are useful additives to our total treatment point of view, but it's not a replacement for, for a physician. Definitely, that's true. Uh, so the people who have gone through the bypass, uh, is there any extra care post heart surgery for people in terms of eating habits? So it's, it's good for everybody, not only for the post bypass or a post uh, stent, or even if you have any blockage. So once you have a blockage, as I showed you, the blockages start to come very early. So if you're already forming the plaque or a fatty streak when you're 15 or 20, you need to take care of from the beginning. So I think moderation is the key. I don't tell anybody, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't do that. But I think do whatever you need to do, but do it in moderation. Every once in a while, whatever you like, do it, but don't do it every day. So don't keep your cholesterol way high. And at the same time, if you had a, a big meal, like you know, Thanksgiving we just had, so exercise for another extra 30 minutes, 40 minutes. So if you consume more calories, burn more calories. So that, you know, you know, whenever I go to the party, Indian party, so if you consume more calories, I want to dance and I want to do come back at home and exercise so that I can burn those extra calories what I consume. It's a, it's a matter of what you're consuming, what you're kind of burning. So it's you need to keep it even so that you don't have an extra plaque farming because you have extra fat in your system. So if you consume 300 calories, you burn 300 calories, so there's no extra. So you don't need to put it in your arteries to form the plaque. So that is more a key, yeah. The low fat diet, low carbohydrate diet with a good carbs, you know, salads, fruits, vegetables. So those are good carbs. You know, if you're eating protein is very good. So those kind of help, but in moderation, whatever you do, we don't mind. If you eat a sweet, it's okay, but don't eat it every day. If you eat meat, it's okay, but don't, don't eat the red meat, like, you know, beef or a lamb or so the, the pork. Don't eat those every day. Every once in a while, if you're a meat eater, it's okay, but don't just consume too much or don't eat every day. That's more a key. So once you have a blockage formed in whatever the way you're diagnosed, it could be our carotids where people get the blockages in the, the neck arteries, which go to the, the brain or it's in the heart or in the legs. Once you have a vascular phenomena starting in your body, it can apply anywhere. It could go to the kidney blockages. It could go to the heart blockages. It could go to the brain blockages. So once you have that tendency to form the plaque, you need to be very aggressive. Take care of, keep the cholesterol down as low as possible. Keep your blood sugars as low as possible. Control your blood pressure and take the treatment like the doctors tell you to do so that you can prevent, or at least you can slow down the progression. If somebody comes to me and says, hey, you have a, can form a blood clot, that's not 100% preventable. But by doing the, the slowly controlling the risk factors, you can prolong it, if not prevent it. Right. And as you've been mentioning about the blockages, so what are the risk factors basically for developing these blockages in heart? So there are risk factors which are controllable. There are risk factors which are not controllable. So let's talk about the fixed fact risk factors which are not controllable, age. Now, as we get older, plaque is going to form. If anybody knows out there who make you not old, let me know. I want that medication too, so that we see. So that as we get older, the plaque slowly forms. So the second, like, you know, sex, I think a male versus female, males are a little bit more prone to develop the disease because of the estrogen and progesterone hormones protect women by about 10 years. So women get the heart disease a little bit later because of the, the hormonal protection. So the, the, the family history, if somebody has a family history, so definitely those are the people will be more aggressive. If somebody in the family had parents or brothers, sisters, anybody had a plaque stent or a bypass, they need to have it checked because there is a genetic predisposition for this plaque formation. So by taking care of the, the early with these high risk factor, pay, high risk individuals, we can identify them early. And then coming to the controllable risk factors, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes. So if you have a diabetes, control the sugars, diagnose, get the diagnose early. And then the cholesterol, if the cholesterol is very high, control it. The diet, control your diet, like we talked about the low fatty diet. And then exercise, at least 30 minutes of exercise per day. I think as individuals, I think we should give our body at least 30 minutes of time every day. You know, nobody's going to take care of our body except us from birth to death. Or we have to take care of our bodies so that we don't get into trouble later on in life. So I think 30 minutes, at least we, we can do it for ourselves, whether you want to do yoga, meditation, one day walking. So you need to take care of you know, both for physical health and mental health. 
I think we concentrate more on the financial health, but I think we need to take care of our physical health, mental health, as much as we worry about the, the money and the financial health, so that when we are older, I think we can our body will take care of us. So don't be having so much pain compared to our having a heart attacks and compared to having the you know amputations of the legs because of the blockages or having a stroke and be bedridden. So we need to take care of early on so that we can prevent those kind of complications at a later date. Smoking is one of the big controllable kind of a thing. Smoking almost increases the heart attack risk about eight to 10 times. So those are the kind of things you need to do it early on so that you won't get into the, the bad kind of a disease at a later date. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then is there any uh, higher risk for heart attacks in people of particularly in Indian subcontinent? Uh, that's one of my uh, favorite kind of a topic to talk about because we see so much heart disease in Indians. So I'll tell you, when I came to Atlanta in 2000, so we didn't have as much, I think, uh, exposure to a lot of American born and trained cardiologists that you know, Indians used to come into my office and then 35, 40 year old, they used to send them home. And then when I came in, I said, no, these are, have a lot of heart disease. So trying to educate my partners who are like American, American born and American trained. So we were kind of, a, now we know a lot more about the, the Indian subcontinent patient, not only patients from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, all Southeast Asians have a three to five times more risk of having a heart disease than Americans three to five times, that's an increasing risk. And we're, that obesity is not as much more, but I think I'll show you a few slides about the, how the risk factors in Southeast Asians, but Southeast Asians are unbelievably increased risk than any other kind of a people from any continent. Not only it's highly prevalent, but it's highly malignant. So when we see the person of Indian origin coming in their forties and fifties, sudden death risk is five times more common. So if you have a, a Caucasian who gets a heart attack, their risk of sudden death is 5% versus the risk of the sudden death in an Indian or subcontinent patient is about 25%, especially in younger people. In below 50, the sudden death risk is a lot higher because the collaterals have not formed. So that when the suddenly blockage happens and the heart artery closes down, there's no collaterals. So suddenly heart goes into this ventricular fibrillation, talk about having causing the cardiac arrest. So not only our risk of heart disease is more common, but the sudden death is, is, risk is more common. And most of the time we have a multivessel disease. If you go to the, the people with the Caucasians, a 50 year old comes in with a blockage and we fix the one blockage and they don't have that many other blockages. Whereas the people from Indian subcontinent, they have a multivessel disease. They have like all three arteries are blocked. There was a bypass risk or need for the bypass is a lot higher in people of Indian subcontinent. I'm going to show you a couple of slides again to just to show you why the the, the deaths in Indian versus everywhere else. So this is, a, so this is the slide about the Southeast Asians and the heart disease. So uh, this slide is actually uh, not. I'm sorry, yeah. let me share. Okay, this is the, the Southeast Asians and the heart disease. So if you take the world heart disease, 60% of the world's heart disease is from Southeast Asia. So that is, I think we're not 60% of the population, but we represent 60% of the world heart disease patients. So as I talked about, it's more multivessel, more left main disease, more sudden death at a young age. So the question is why we have so much heart disease So Southeast Asians have more uncle obesity. If you look at Indian or Southeast Asian people, they have more belly fat than the other areas of the fat. When obesity develops, it's more excessive fat in the abdominal fat. That becomes also more increase in insulin resistance. That causes more diabetes. India is a diabetic capital of the world. So I think one third of the Indians, whether we like it or not, have diabetes or insulin resistance. So yeah, and probably half of them are not even diagnosed. So we need to have early diagnosis of the diabetes and then take care of the blood pressure, take care of the insulin resistance so that we don't develop the future the blockages. These are kind of a unique risk factors for the Southeast Asians. So our good cholesterol, which is HDL, is kind of small. It's not, it also is not as functional as HDL is a scavenger. So when you have a high HDL or the good cholesterol, 
So the LDL forms the plaque into the arteries and the HDL tries to get rid of it. So if you have a high HDL, so even though you're forming the plaque, you'll take care of it. So even though our LDL is not as bad, but our HDL, the particles are not as big and don't do the job like other HDL does in the other people. So these are all others, like you know, some of the, the risk factors for developing, like their scientists or researchers are looking at. There's not that much treatment for the other things, but these are all people think are the reason why we get more heart disease. So smoking starts early in life in Southeast Asia. So that's the one thing you've seen people in their 10, 15, 20, they start smoking at a younger kind of age. So to identify the, the calcium, which is the plaque built up in the heart. So I think uh, this is one of the, the studies, the called CT scan for the calcium score. So if you see all this plaque here, this is the blockage, wherever there's a plaque, Calcium can get into that area, forming the heart plaque. So this is the calcium where we can identify very easily. With in America, it's like hundred dollar test. I think in India, I think it's probably five hundred or one thousand rupees kind of a test where with a CT scan you can identify this is all the plaque. So it doesn't tell us whether there's a plaque is fifty percent or eighty percent. Just tells us that you have a tendency to form the plaque. So with a simple test you can identify the plaque. So. I think uh, people can just look into those kind of things. And this is called CT angiography, where we can identify, as if you see here, there is a, a type 95 to 99% blockage in this artery here. So this is called CT angiogram, where we can inject the contrast into the IV and we can identify the plaque really easy. Yes, that was really, really helpful. Uh, coming to the last question that we have, any extra steps to be taken as a care factor for your heart since the beginning? So I think basically you need to take care of the, the risk factors. As we get older, the plaque forms more. So take care of your you know, exercise part, diet part. Those are simple. Is that 30 minutes of time of exercise? No, diet, majority of the time, eat right, not to smoke. And get a phys physicals done. I think we need to be more proactive than being reactive. So I think uh, majority of the people, you think oh, I'm not having any symptoms, so I'm not having any problems, so I'm not going to go see the doctor. But I think there may be a problem going on, which we may not be knowing because it's not at a level where it's not causing the symptoms. So you need to be proactive, at least once a year, get a physical done, get your cholesterol checked, so that if it's high, you can take care of the cholesterol early on so that we don't need to worry about having a heart attack or a blockage and then take care of the cholesterol versus taking care of now. Same thing with the diabetes. The blood sugars are going higher. Take care of it now so that we don't need to have the, the problems in the future. So exercise, controlling the hypertension, controlling the diabetes, not to smoke. You know, con control the controllable risk factors which are there, which we know that everybody knows. But I think we need to be just more cautious about you know, what, what we are doing every year. So when you go to the doctor, doctor can identify the problem and then give you the guidance to, for you to prevent those kind of uh, heart attacks or the sudden death in the future. Yeah, great, yeah. So I guess we are done with the questions and uh, thank you so much, doctor, for your time and uh, explaining and informing us everything about the heart health. And uh, okay, yeah. I'm gonna show a couple more slides, uh, Arya, so yeah. that people can just uh, see what sure. the thing from, uh, I think the pictures will give you a lot more. So, so this is the, the bad cholesterol called LDL. So you want to keep, if you have a blockage or if you have a um, diabetes, I think you need to keep it under 70. For Southeast Asians, I keep it always under 70 because we are, because of our risk being so high, I think I treat them like they already have diabetes or they already have uh, blockages. So the good cholesterol, you want to keep it over 40. The triglycerides, you want to keep it under 150. Uh, this when you talked about a little bit about the weight maintenance and the low fat diet. So this is actually my, so please take care of yourself to avoid injuries because the spare parts for the old models are no longer in stock, okay? Most of us are born in 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s models. Warranty period was long over. Expiry date is due soon. Caution is better. Keep reminding yourself we are limited edition. And by taking care of yourself, even the spare parts are not available, you don't want to get spare parts. You don't want a cardiologist's help. People can take care of themselves by following a healthy, healthy lifestyle. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Srini, for this amazing slide presentation and your information. Uh, so just to inform you guys, coming 3rd December, coming Friday, we'll have another doctor who is Dr. Anup Katyal, our uh, expert in sleep medicine, critical care, and internal medicine. And we'll be having a few more questions related to the same. So don't forget to follow us to get the more updates about the timings and everything. So thank you so much, Dr. Srini, for your time. It was really informative session. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for thank you.